Hey, family, church, and friends, Pastor Dean Ross here. I'd like to welcome you to our Advent season. Uh, maybe you've heard that term before, maybe you haven't. Advent comes from a Latin word named Adventus, and the church throughout history has celebrated this season of liturgy by looking back at, at Jesus' first arrival and towards his second arrival. And that Latin word Adventus means coming or arrival. And so today, as we begin this series, uh, looking at the promises of Jesus or the stories of Advent, uh, I pray that we are we would be encouraged by his first coming as we look forward to his second coming. This week's sermon is entitled Wonderful Counselor. In the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And you've heard this at Christmas time. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The big idea that we're going to explore this week is the first of those titles, Wonderful Counselor. And the big idea is this, Jesus is our Wonderful Counselor. Isaiah, had, Isaiah was a prophet in, in the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel was split up into two kingdoms at this time. You had the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And, and, and Judah was in a time of, tur time of turmoil. They were threatened by their, their brothers to the north. They were even threatened by the evil empire Assyria, which was just north of Israel. And during this time, the king Ahaz, Isaiah actually started... His, his role of prophecy during the year that Uzziah died. And Uzziah was a good king, but Isaiah served under five different kings as a prophet and a counselor in the king's court. And we see that, that uh, in, uh, during the reign of Ahaz, who, was, who, pro, who Isaiah was primarily prophesied to at this point, that Israel was, or that Judah wasn't trusting in a good God. Their leaders weren't trusting and a good God, they were making unholy alliances. They were doing things to protect their own interests. And so that's why this uh, book of Emmanuel, which is what the beginning part of Isaiah is called. And some scholars call this uh, Isaiah the fifth gospel, along with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because it's so quoted. It's quoted more than any other Old Testament book in the New Testament. It points so towards the Messiah who's going to come and be born in a manger Jesus Christ. And so we see Isaiah begins his prophecy in Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive a son and call his name Emmanuel. Then you jump two chapters here to chapter 9, and it opens up by Isaiah acknowledging the setting that God's people were in at this time. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt and the land of deep darkness on them light has shone. Jesus was the, was the light that came into the world, and we now, as his people, are the light of the world as we fulfill the mission that he has called us to do. Jesus is our wonderful counselor. If we're going to leave the hurt and the turmoil and the pain of life behind and trust in Jesus, if we are going to live out Jesus' commands, we need to know that he is the wonderful counselor. And when you look at Wonderful Counselor, it's a, it's a title, yes, but it also describes aspects of who Jesus is. You see, Wonderful Counselor, uh, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace are actually eight different titles, but we see these eight titles make up four different names uh, that Jesus had, that the coming Messiah would have, because Hebrew names were made up of two different names, and so that's why we cluster Wonderful Counselor together, but we're reminded first that Jesus is wonderful. The word here, wonderful, in the Hebrew literally means miracle. He's miraculous. He exceeds all of our expectations. Douglas Connolly writes, in a world that was falling apart, Isaiah points back to the only certainty that can be found is in an unfailing God. How often do we trust in ourselves to handle our circumstances? How often do we think that we have the answers rather than looking and staring at the mystery of who God is. Francis Chan once wrote one of the, in a book of his called Letters to the Church that if achievement is your idol, you won't make time for mystery. In fact, the Bible talks about Jesus oftentimes as mysterious. In the gospel, the good news is mysterious. It doesn't always have to add up. I, I, I 
don't make time to med we don't make time to meditate on his mysteries enough. Don't try to solve the mystery. Don't try to solve Jesus as wonderful counselor. Just stare at him. Accept him for who he is. Accept that he is wonderful. He's mysterious. He is miraculous. Like Ahaz, many of us we trust in our own ways rather than trusting in the unfailing God. Louis Giglio writes in his Advent devotional entitled, Waiting Here for You. All of us are waiting on something, often wondering if God has forgotten us. In your waiting, let the birth of Christ encourage you. Just because God hasn't come through as far as you can see, it doesn't mean that he has abandoned you. This very minute, he's working for his, for his glory, and you're good. Don't give up before the time is right. Take hope in the manger and know that you are loved and prized by the by God who stepped down from heaven and arrived advented at the perfect time. Jesus is wonderful. Second is this Jesus is our counselor. Jesus is the counselor. And the word here in Hebrew for counsel is is it looks like the word we use in New Orleans, yak. It's actually Y A apostrophe A T S. And this word yaks means uh Wise advice, counsel, devising a plan. In fact, in the world, as we often say, where are you at? It means, what are we going to do? Well, when we look at the yacht in Scripture, we have a certainty of what God is doing and what he has done. But we, like oftentimes, we, we trust in ourselves, and Proverbs reminds us of this. Proverbs 12, verse 15, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to counsel. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to, to a man, but its its end is the way of death. Uh, Proverbs 15, verse 22, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs 21, verse 2, and verse 21, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. We too often we trust in our own counsel rather than the counsel of those around us, rather than the counsel of God's word, rather than the counsel of the Holy Spirit and God's truth, which supersedes everything else. Scripture tells us that we can find counsel in parents, in elders, in prophets, in wise people, and in friends. And in fact, the counselor in biblical times was a person who served in the king's court kind of like the modern-day U.S. cabinet advising the leader in what to do. But we see that Jesus isn't just a counselor. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the counselor of all counselors. And Isaiah uh, reminds us in chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, another prophecy. There shall come forth from the stump of the root of, from the, from the stump of Jesse, and as a branch from the root shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him a spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of, of knowledge, spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. That person was Jesus Christ, who came to us from David, Jesse's root, and we see that he was born in a manger in Bethlehem, and that's the greatest light, the greatest hope that we could ever have. I want to invite you to join that family, join in the family that Jesus is our wonderful counselor. You can do that and, and, and by following Jesus, by surrendering everything, like and rather than trusting in your own advice like Ahaz, surrender to the wonderful counselor of Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him wouldn't have to perish but would have everlasting life, John 3, 16. We see that Jesus, even when he was with his disciples, he said, it's to your, to your advantage that I go away. They didn't want that. He had told them, like, hey, I'm about to die. My time is coming to an end. They didn't want him to go. He says, to your advantage that I leave, because when I leave, I will send you a counselor, a helper that will guide you into all truth. Furthermore, he told his disciples in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? None of us want to give our kids coal for Christmas. None of us want to give our, our kids bad gifts. We we want to give them good gifts, even when they're bad. Like, that's just nature. We want to bless them. And if we who have evil intentions, who are evil apart from Christ, know how to give these good gifts, 
How much more will God the Father give his very presence, the Holy Spirit, to those who ask? I'm going to ask you today, would you surrender your life to Jesus? Would you be filled with the Holy Spirit? Would you let him work mightily for his glory and on your behalf? You know, Scripture says when we don't know what to pray, that God prays for us. The Holy Spirit prays for us. And that there's one mediator between God and man. It's Christ Jesus. And that actually the one who knows the mind of the Spirit intercedes for us. And so we see that Jesus is in complete control. The Holy Spirit is in, has sealed us as his people. And he's guiding us into all truth. To the glory of God the Father. We worship a great God. And I want to invite you to worship that great God along with us today. Romans 10, 19 says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you surrender everything this Christmas season to Jesus Christ and receive the greatest gift that you could ever be given. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for just the gifts coming down from heaven and coming here to our, the dirtiness of our earth. That you, God, you love, so loved the world that you gave your only son, Jesus, that if we would believe in him, we wouldn't perish, but we'd have everlasting life. And now we have your very presence living in us, the Holy Spirit, who is working in us, gifting us, and sealing us, and helping guide us until the day that we meet you in eternity and worship you forever. Lord, if there's someone listening today who doesn't know you as Savior, God, I pray they would lay everything down and surrender to you. It's in your name that we pray, amen. If you would like to talk to somebody, maybe you made a decision today. Maybe you'd like more information about Family Church. I invite you to go to our website, jointhefamily.church. You can also give a gift. We're talking about uh, the greatest gift of salvation being given uh, to us through Jesus Christ. Well, maybe you want to give some sort of gift, your, your time, your talent, or your treasure. If you want to give uh, financially or some other sort of resource back to the church, Go online to our website and, and click the Give tab at jointhefamily.church. We would love to see you here in person gathering with us. All the information about our gatherings are there online and on social media. Just look up Family Church NOLA. Again, I'm Pastor Dean Ross with Family Church NOLA. God bless, and we'll see you next week.